you're always looking in the mirror. You're the only one that's going to help you. No one else is going to fix you. God is not going to fix you. The therapist is not going to fix you. It's about you fixing you. And the way you do that is to figure out how to accept and go through the process that you would, that Brian, you're talking about with your wife. That's got to take place internally with self. Welcome to Men This Way. Uh, welcome, man. As you know, this is uh, an experiment. We've been, how long have we been having these meetings now? We've been doing That's this for a good question. Six months? Six months, yeah. Six months, I'd say, that'd be my guess. Yeah. About six months. And uh, over the course of these six months, you know, I usually wake up groggy. I usually come in, you know, uh, <laughs> looking like I'm hungover, though I don't drink. Because it's 7 a.m. my time. Y'all are looking a lot more chipper and bright than I ever do. Uh, but, but I, I always, always am so served by these conversations that we've been having. So, uh, you know, thank you for joining me in this experiment. And, uh, today we want to talk about the mother wound, but I also want to presence what's happening in the world right now. Like we're two weeks away from the election in the United States at the time of this recording. On some degree, like the whole world is on edge, right? I mean, we've been, before we started recording, we're sharing some of what's coming up for all of us as well at this moment. Uh, John, I I'm curious, you introduced this topic of the mother wound uh, a few weeks ago, right? Maybe two, two or four or four weeks ago in one of our conversations. Can you say what is the mother wound and how does that tend to then express in, in, a, in, a, in a man, let's say, or in a woman for that matter? Well, you know, I, I'll say a few words about it and then hopefully everybody will give their own uh, understanding and sense of it. But just to say that this, this is how it started. Uh, getting me back. I mean, I've been thinking about the mother wound. <laughs> and I was even, uh, before we came on, I was thinking, maybe I should write a book about the mother wound. And I thought, oh, wait, I already have. <laughs> I mean, that's just how forgetful I can get. No, wait, I did, I did do that already. Um, so, but a young man in London he read the book on my suggestion, He, which is about the mother wound, the mother-son relationship by Robert Johnson. And uh, when I had his next session, he, he was just, he had an ecstatic experience with that book. Uh, yeah, there you go. This book, the one I'm holding right here? Yeah, that's, that's it. One. And uh, he talked about it, and he t told me what the what he experienced, and and how his mind got blown. And I thought, you know what? I better look at this book again. That would only make the sixth time I've read it, cover to cover. And I saw some stuff in there that I just, thanks to him, my client, I go, wow, I need to do some more work on this mother wound stuff. So here's one snippet that I, I gleaned from the book, me thinking about the book, we were supposed to be mothered in a nurturing, positive, compassionate uh, way. And some of us got that. I didn't. Um, and in direct proportion to what our relationship with our biological mother, it was or was not helps create this mother wound and and for one of my understandings is is that we turn people places and things into a mother that will come and save us and and give us the uh, the fruits, the benefits of mothering that we did not get as a kid. And so consequently, I have turned whim to, to women to uh, try to provide stuff that obviously 
I didn't get. And if I got it, it would heal me. See, that that's that's the thing that I want to stress. If I get this job, it will heal me and save me. If I get this uh, uh, book deal, it will heal me and save me. Um, you know, if I get the a financial windfall that will heal me and save me. And, and that in a nutshell is the mother wound if looking for save. Now, the problem with the mother wound also is it gets manifested different uh, in, in different forms. Like for instance, uh, we don't talk much about the witch mother. Um, and that's a major part of the, the mother uh, wound um, and the mother complex. Um, yeah, we don't talk about the what, what other what other archetypes that fit in the mother, the witch, it's the, 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 the crone, the smothering, the smothering. Yeah, the smothering mother or the abandoning mother, by the way. See, if you if you were if you were mothered by a smothering mother or an abandoning mother, you're going to have a wound the size of this house. That you're going to have to heal. Yeah, yeah. Brad Brad Robinson in his book um, "Death of the Hero, Birth of the Soul" talks about the John, feminine. John Robinson. John Robinson. Thank you. One one, one of uh, his sides of the feminine is the jailer. That you, that that your that your wife acts as the jailer, and so you know, oh, I can't do so and so because she'll harp on me or something. Like Interesting. That. I, I have a, I have a friend. A very close friend who actually spent a year living with a woman who was agoraphobic. And he lived in her, I don't know, I guess one bedroom ish apartment uh, for an entire year, barely leaving. Talk about, you know, as the woman as, as jailer. I don't know that, but I, that, that's fascinating. And I never heard that, but it makes so much sense. I mean, so many men, I think, are tur turned to see their feminine partner or their, their female partner anyway, she becomes their jailer. Well, the, the devouring mother, uh, that's a, that's a way to characterize this a little bit is, uh, you know, um, they, we pick people, not just women, but people that will devour our energy. Um, and that's the mother complex too. I, I had a mother who said, wait till your father gets home. And then when my father got home, I was to be beat. And yeah. he would beat me. And until I cried, uh, when my mother would then tell him to stop. And wow, that, that uh, got played out many times in my childhood. And so that put quite a spin on it. I had a two day intensive this past weekend with a guy and, you know, he, I brought up the fact that he'd been severely beaten as a kid and he had never thought or dealt with the idea that his mother never intervened on his behalf. Uh, never, but he, and it, he's sitting in his chair that I'm in, it blew him out of the water. He never thought about that. Uh, uh, this big old ex military guy, uh, muscle, you know, he just, it, it blew him away. So I've never, I knew my dad beaten, but, but John, where was my mother? And I said, she's absent and an absent mother you know, who won't intervene. I mean, that, that was true in my case. Mom, why don't you take us to granddad's and get the him, granddad to get his son to stop beating us. And, oh, honey, I didn't want your grandma and grandfather to know that about your dad. And I said, so you, you were saving their feelings at the expense of ours? And she said, yeah, I guess so. I'm sorry, but I thought, whew, that'll take 10,000 hours of therapy right there. <laughs> when I think about this, and I was even journaling about this myself, kind of post our last conversation, and the thing that continues to come up with me and the thing I present even with my clients is that the mother wound is a, is a wound of worth and value. 
And it's also a, a wound of desire in the sense that, you know, father wound, mother wound, in Jung's kind of concept of the self, you have the masculine and the feminine, the anima, and the animus lying deep underneath the surface of every person. And it's like the mother wound really hits, as, as I've seen it, that like felt sense of, do I have worth? Do I have value in the world? And the father wound, just to put the alternate there, is hits so much on identity. So it's like, when I see people struggling with father wound, they're always asking like, who am I? What's my purpose? Because their identity feels shaky. Uh, but when it comes to the mother wound, they're asking like, am I lovable? Do I have something to contribute? Why am I here? You know, is it okay for me to be me? Like these deeper, you know, struggles of shame that I think we all bump into seem to just lie on top of that foundation so hard. Um, and so when it say, comes to say, like, say that again, Mikey, the mother wound is about worth self-worth. and value worth and value do i belong am i lovable am i worthy to even be on the planet and the father wound in your sense is what now a wound of identity who am i who am i oh Mm -hmm. brilliant um because i feel like you know what i've learned and seen in my own healing journey as well as all the stuff i've perused in the Jungian world and everywhere else even like he you know the 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 Percival myth is all about like the mother saying, go, go do this and do this this way. You know, there's there's no sense of like um, generativity. And there's even a, a like self-doubt that comes into that story where it's like, mm-hmm. you know, the way that I've understood that myth from he is that it's like Percival has this deep... Uh, encounter with psyche or with soul but when he's actually met with soul he can't show up and and do naturally what would come out of him because his mother has restricted it before you know and and so it's like that the natural worth and value that we have allows things just to flow out of us you know it's that very feminine quality and when that gets all muddled up because we had a less than ideal mother or an incredibly abusive mother. It's like your ability to feel like it's okay for you to be you and say what you want to say, do what you want to do, be who you want to be just falls apart. And I can even see it. I can see in my own life where it's like, I feel really proud of how far I've come, but it's like, Oh yeah, that shit is still there. (laughs) It's like, ah man, like, I have a hard time truly trusting the fact that if I were to take a risk on the things I really desire, that it would actually work out. Yeah. And that's I, just like mother wound all over the place. <laughs> well, let, let me just say to what you just add to what you said, she doesn't want him to go at all at first because it's going to break her heart. Her name in the book is heart sorrow. Yeah. Heart um, sorrow. And then the second piece that always stuck out every time she she made him a thin fine garment to wear underneath his armor you know and she did not want him to be like um, her husband and her other sons she wanted a feminized man a mothered man and she wants to, that garment goes with him wherever he goes. And when I read that the first time in 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I thought, God damn, I've got that garment, you know, melded into my body. It's been there so long. On this topic, and, and I appreciate everybody share so far, um, you, you know, I, I, two women have come to speak to me uh, in the last 24 hours on so, something in this nature and category. One is Brene Brown. And so this was shared in a, in a meeting yesterday I was a part of. She says, don't walk through the world looking for evidence you don't belong because you will always find it. Don't walk through the world looking for evidence you are not enough because you will always find it. Our worth and our belonging are not negotiated with other people. We carry our worth and our belonging inside our hearts. I know who I am. I am clear about that. 
I'm not going to negotiate that with you because then I may fit for you, but I no longer belong to myself. And that is betrayal. And I'm not willing to do that anymore. And, and you know, along with that, we were doing this uh, ceremony we've been doing annually for 31 years with the Earth Tribe called the Earth Dance. And in one of the directions, in the directions of the West, one of our members danced it. And part of the West is recognizing those voices in you that you don't you don't want you want to distance yourself from so she she gave us those uh that game cards against humanity and and i mean some of these sayings were just like as gross and off the wall as you can imagine right and one of the members of our tribe a woman she said to me later what she noticed in herself in order to play that game she had to disconnect from her heart and I thought, Interesting. wow, yeah. in order for me to play this game, whatever it may be, vote for that candidate or show up at a job I don't really like, I have to disconnect from my heart. And I was like, wow, man. And so and then I'll end, I'll end this with my, my other favorite woman author lately, Sophia Strand, wrote this article about no savior. And she was talking about Joan of Arc, right? And she says, uh, while no one came to save Joan in July of 1431, we can save her now from bad stories that gloss over the pain and complexity of her experience. We can honor the texture and tenacity of her life instead of her death. We can reclaim the wild landscapes and anonymous practices that inspired her visions. There will be no savior for any of us. No personal salvation, no single person or species is going to make it alone. We need councils of being, many different perspectives. We need diversity. And that that is that, is that web, that uh, sacred web that we're a part of, of different voices that I think if we can listen to these different voices, we have, uh, we have some hope. At least I do. Let's stay here for a moment in this idea of, of wanting something to save us. Because I think, you know, <clears throat> life the last few years has, I, I'm in one of the hardest seasons of my life. Just what all the things that my wife have gone through, my wife and I have gone through in the last couple of years, like we have just, our lives have been upended into turmoil and, and loss has been uh, dominant. Um, I mean, there's so much still to be grateful for. And my God, you know, we did an inventory even last night. That's why you, I, I was sharing with you, you Mikey, before we all jumped on that, you know, yesterday was one of those days that when we went to bed, we just said, Let, let's just put this day, but let's just be done with this day. <laughs> We're done. Let's put this behind us. Let's get on with the next. Cause this one, oh, this one took a painful turn. We did an inventory of, of, just all the things that we've been encountered with. And, and um, you know, I think even in, in relationship, uh, I think a lot of men and certainly myself, uh, John, you said, you spoke to this early in this conversation, like we, we look to a, a woman or an intimate partner to save us. And I think one of the, I think one of the confrontations in the long-term relationship and, you know, my wife and I both are really facing this, that that I'm not going to save her and she's not going to save me. And there's a disillusionment in that. There's a there's a painful, painful realization like a it hurts on some level to to it's a it's the death of a dream almost like with it, that fantasy that I'm going to meet this woman and everything's going to be better and, and, and all my problems, you know, problems no more. Uh, and I think that it can carry us for a few years, maybe if we're lucky, a lot of us only get a few months at, at most. Uh, some of us live in that illusion for decades. Right. Uh, but, but inevitably if we're being honest, if we're really seeing what is there to be seen that, 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 confrontation happens. Okay, this person is not going to save me. Uh, I'm thinking of the presidential election. This president is not going to save us. Whichever president gets elected, they're not going to save us. 
And now, see, this this is also the core message of fundamental Christianity that Jesus is going to save us. Right. Jesus saves. Have you been saved? Jesus saves. That question. Yes. Oh, right. Have you been that. saved? <laughs> Jesus will save you. And and it really emanates out of the mother complex that uh, this mystical being, you know, on a deeper level, uh, you know, Jesus is a model for uh, loving, charitable, uh, kind, compassionate behavior and and more morality. But on this uh, superficial level, I would call it a superficial level, he's here to save us. And, and all we got to do is just turn our will over to that. And, and then we'll be saved and we'll be okay. No matter, you know, my dad, uh, being a Baptist, they, the Southern Baptist has principle, uh, once saved, always saved. So that you know you can you can beat the shit out of your kids you can you can kill somebody and and Dad would say yep once saved always saved no matter what I do oh I'm God. saved wow and I go God, God damn I wish I saved right. I wish. yeah well, I sign, and, where do I go where do I sign, I, sign me and up and I pursued that I pursued that route in my late teens and twenties and very early thirties it's like yeah you know Mom didn't save me but Jesus will. What I'd like you to look at is the role of the therapist as the saver. Uh, 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 uh. I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to deal with this. And uh, eventually it came to the point where I realized that I'm not the saver. And I would put that in the session. I'm not going to save you. And basically what I can do to you is that I have figured out ways to communicate what I see when you come in my office, what I hear when you speak to me, which is what your life hears and sees when they see you. And I can do that pretty effectively. And I learned how to use a role called the role reverse. And I very often took the patient, put them in, or the client, put them in the seat and had them be someone they're in relationship with. And there's guidelines to how you set that up. So they have to hold to telling the truth out of that place. And once that's happened, you can begin to open the door to beginning to see people that in reality, you're always looking in the mirror. You're the only one that's going to help you. No one else is going to fix you. God is not going to fix you. The therapist is not going to fix you. It's about you fixing you. And the way you do that is to figure out how to accept and go through the process that you would, that Brian, you're talking about with your wife. That's got to take place internally with self. And that's how I believe it really works. And this came to me from the, the book, The Transparent Self. That book had, had been a, a, an incredible, valuable tool for me to understand and to use. It took a long time to figure out how to use it. And basically on today, I'm using it on myself. And I, I, I have even patted myself on the back if I did something that I didn't want to do. Because I, there's a higher self that says, hey, that's the thing to do. If you want change, that's the only way it's going to happen. And so I throw that into the ring. And I also, there's another, there's another piece to it, which is what I wrote about that I sent you. And it's that our internal psyche, our internal world, reflects what's going on in the external world. They are connected together. What's going on in the politics, what's going on in the humanity and the inhumanity in the world is the same thing that goes on inside of us. And the world has a soul and we have a soul. And until we listen to it, we're, you know, we're, we're going to just continue towards the exit at rapid speed. Yeah, it's like a, a mentor of mine used to always tell me, you are the one you're waiting on. No one's going to come save you. You, you are the one. It, it, it's for me, it, it's that, that piece of uh, responsibility 
Uh, and it's also this piece of accountability. You know, at the end of the day, who, who's holding you accountable? I have a good friend um, and she's in her 30s now. And she said, you know, before I ever got married again or even dated a guy, I would ask him, who in your circle of friends holds you accountable for your Ooh, actions? That's a great question to ask. Ooh, <clears> that's wow. a, isn't it? I, yeah. I mean, and, and most people, most men would have to answer nobody. Nobody, no fact. right? No, that's a fact. I, which, I, means, I, which means I, she's going to. Who, who do she's you gonna talk be to? Who do you tell your pain and your stories to? My wife, my wife, if you have one, or my girlfriend. Well, you know, so that that puts us back. You know, again, who do you tell it to? My wife. I'm looking for my wife slash mother to make everything okay. You know, it's like uh, Robert said. Uh, um, a million years ago, uh, that you are supposed to tell this pain to a man before you tell it to a woman. And I was always in my tw teens, 20s, and early 30s telling to a woman my pain and almost never a man because I didn't have intimate relationships with men. And, and that's that stems out of the mother world. Son, don't be like your father. Don't be like your uncles. And, and uh, listen to me and, and heed my, my advice. And by God, it stuck, you know. Well, and, and how many how many men in, that have been married for a number of years begins to refer to their wife as mom? Mom, yeah. It's true. My mom and dad calls each other mom and daddy. He's 95, she's 93, and they've been calling each other that since they got married. That's funny. That's funny. Look, we have a dog, you know, my wife and I, and we I call we call each other mommy and daddy. <laughs> what, what are we talking about here, Troy? What, 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 what are we getting out of here? <laughs> I think something that stands out to me in some of this, and it's something that I wrestle with, and it's like, I think it humanizes some of this in a really profound way is it's like, well, what's underneath all of that, right? Like if the, if a mom is saying, Hey, you know, passively, or maybe even overtly, don't be like your father and, and come over here. And it's like, but the child, like what's the child experiencing in that moment? It's like, well, like, I don't know, but like, I want to feel connection. I want to feel safe. I want to feel reassured. You know, whenever, you know, that's the trope where it's like whenever a kid gets hurt or even like a dog, if you're a dog parent like we are, it's like, where does it go? It goes to mom. And what is that? And it's like, well, the feminine is meant to be this powerful force, um, but we doubt it so readily um, in our experience of people who harness feminine energy. And I'll stop there because that's a whole saying, but like. I think underneath it, it's like, well, what are we looking for? So we're looking for relief. It's like, what do you want? Why do you want someone to save you? Because you're tired, you're disenfranchised, you feel confused. There's a loneliness that you don't know what to do with. It's all these existential realities of what it means to be human. But because we have treated those as things to be spot, we end up projecting this dissociation of our own feeling onto people, places, and things, and, and the feminine or women in our lives just take the brunt of that. So then you get into a relationship and you're not feeling the relief. You're not feeling like you can make sense of what's happening into you and you get pissed. And what do you do with that anger? You, you turn it into this, you turn it into that. And it's like our inability to be with our own hearts for whatever reason, because we had a shitty mother, because we have a shitty dad, because the world's crazy, whatever the reason is, the problem is you can't be with your own heart. You can't hold the profundity of your own desire. And therefore, you require and necessitate that other people do that for you. And that's just like, it's such a bind. You know, you said earlier, Brian, that like, when you were thinking about your relationship, it was like, oh, I was hoping that this thing would happen. And I would say it did happen. Like, look at your relationship. Look at who you're married to. Like, it is there. It, it is 100% there. But, and I have to do this with myself sometimes too. It's like, I met the woman of my dreams and she's human. 
But the relief that I'm looking for can happen in relationship, but I have to learn to appreciate it in whatever form it comes and my inability to appreciate it and actually absorb it and receive it in whatever way it comes, whether it be through a miniature moment of sunset to a little hug to whatever, like my inability to tolerate that is what fuels this. Um, so anyways, well, what's really lighting up for me and what you're sharing is you use that word relief and another word that lives right alongside that is soothe. And, you know, as a coach, I, I had that realization many, many years ago that that what people are really coming to me for to any of us for, I think, is is relief. It is relief. And and what I notice in, oh, man, this is just really coming a lot for me, Mikey. Thank you for that, because that idea of relief, of being soothed, <clears throat> I saw Ayanna Van Zant did this uh interview in which she said uh Ayanna Van Zant, she's that author she wrote a bunch of books she's amazing this just just you know elder wise black woman just she's spoken to me many times over the years just said something that pierced me and um she said uh in this interview I was a terrible mother but I was a great father and and what she was essentially pointing at which you know my mom great father <laughs> probably a terrible mother no i look if my, if my mom listen mom i love you you are amazing i have nothing but good things to say about you and what i'm aware of is nobody really ever soothed me growing up i was never really soothed my you know just you know without going into details just i i i so lots of things were going on that were painful and hurtful. Nobody ever really checked in with how I was feeling and helped soothe those parts of me. So I grew up turned into an adult, you know, also just being a boy in this world, going into your fraternity and the military and feeling just endlessly <clears throat> unsoothed, right? Turning to masturbation, turning to eventually uh, well, always women, you know, seeking that relief, the soothing, the relief and getting it for maybe a second. Right. And then I'm right back in my pain, you know, as soon as the orgasm is over, you know, the little, you know, that, that little afterglow. And then once that subsides, I'm right back in that, uh, this life's life's hard. This hurt. I'm, I'm in pain. And, and, uh, you know, even in all the things that my wife have been going through these last few years, I think this is what's really coming alive for me. One of the one of the things that's hardest for me to receive from my wife, who is an amazing woman, she's so emotionally attuned. She is, she's like all she wants to do in a way is soothe me, but I can't. It's so hard for me to receive that. I I block that in a million countless ways. Meanwhile, you know, I'm 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 still looking to the outside world outside of what my wife wants to offer for soothing, you know, somehow like, Oh, if we just get the business part figured out, if we just get our home figured out, then I'll, then I'll have the relief. And meanwhile, I have this amazing woman here who was like, just chill, man. Let me, let me love on you. <laughs> like, no, that's not what I need. I need something else. It's a fucking mind fuck endlessly so anyway that's just coming alive for me right now well and, and Brian, kind of kind of tied into that for me is you know i can remember when i was sick with strep throat and the flu and i'm laying in my bed and my mom's got an ice cube holding it over my mouth dripping it in my throat right to soothe me and and, and part of what you're talking about for me is i i resonate with what you say totally is that I know I still have this little boy in me that wants his mommy to drop ice in his mouth when he's in pain, right? And, and I can't take back those experiences. I can't take back my projections. Until I take back my projections that she ain't going to be there to do that anymore, and, and it's up to me to self-soothe, I'm going to still be looking for something on the outside of me, whether it's porn, something to buy, chase after, something to soothe me, Right. One of the things that's coming up for me in this is it's like, again, what's underneath that? It's like, gosh, like, I'm, I'll use some charge words that I don't use, but it's like, it's it sounds like underneath all of this is a dilemma 
of faith and trust. Because it's like how many of us had the experience when we were a kid that a mother or someone came to soothe us. And if we look back on it in our adult mind, they didn't do anything that actually soothed us, but we believed that it did. You know, it's like you kiss the boo-boo. Kissing, kissing a, a <laughs> cut doesn't do shit. It might actually make it worse depending on that person's <laughs> mouth, you know? But, but the child's point of view is, I believe it. I trust it. I have faith that this exchange is facious. And it's like, in what in what both of you guys just said, it's like, if we don't believe that life is beautiful, then nothing will soothe us. Well, I, I, I never received soothing. I was the soother. And uh, in my late 30s, early 30s, I was at a, going to a conference uh, to speak. And my mom happened to be in the same city. And I was exhausted sitting in the front seat. And she said, son, you look so exhausted. And from the back seat, she started massaging my shoulders. And I started sobbing, you know. And she said, honey, why are you crying? And I said, mom, you have never done this for me. And she said, that's right. You have done this for me many, many times when you were a little boy. And it was true, you know. And, and uh, it, 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 I mean, just her doing that, just the damn burst, and because of the recognition that I'd never had that. So like all of us, so I went looking for it externally, usually in the eyes of a woman. Well, you, you, you know, here recently, and I'll tie this into, because it, it's sort of interesting that the, the, the myth of Parsifal was brought up, right? So the other night I had this really quick dream where I'm in this canyon and I notice there's a, a cave with some hot rocks being heated. And I look up on this, this terrace and there's these human beings. That's all I could make out because it was real quick. They were running with wolves. And I was like, wow, what's going on here? And then the next thing I know, I look down and I have this big gash in my right calf and these two wolf pups come up and they're licking it, you know, as a way to soothe and heal it, right? And, um, but what came to me after the dream was, A, it reminisced me of the Parsifal wound, right? But the part of it that really got me was I didn't even know in the dream I was wounded. Didn't even know I was wounded. And at the same time, a force in nature in the in the form of a wolf was doing the healing you know one of the things that you were talking about mikey you know because my mother covertly and overtly said don't be like your dad and your uncles and stuff what i developed and i talked about this quite a bit a lot of times at at the men's gatherings was i developed what i called the false feminine not not the authentic archetypal feminine but a false feminine and 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 uh, acted that out in my tw late teens early 20s and and er early to mid 30s that that i wanted people to think that i was deeply in touch with my feminine side um, you were so woke oh, oh yeah yeah. <laughs> You're a pioneer of wokeness. Right, right, right. <laughs> and and it took me into my 30s and doing men's work to realize the charade that I had perpetrated on myself and on others trying to not be uh like my dad and my uncles. And yet I'm hyper uh, masculine. I got a beard down to here, hair down to here, wearing flat shirt, flannel shirts, and boots and jeans, you know. And, and it was just all a facade and all a charade. And so, you know, and then I, I just had, it. and then I'd say to, to the men, how many of you can relate to that sense that you created a false feminine? And lots of hands would go up. This is going to be maybe an asshole statement, but isn't that what the current men's 
movement is led by is a bunch of man buns and sticks and <laughs> uh, yeah maybe so maybe, maybe so. so maybe so I, I really relate with that john I, I mean it's only been recently and we touched on this at the beginning of the conversation was the very many facets of the feminine and and i was introduced for example, the Baba Yaga through myth, right? And 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 as an aspect of of she demands authenticity from you, right? And 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 I know I have a client that just drives him nuts because every time he regresses into his boy, his wife calls him out on it. And it fucking drives him nuts, you know? And and I'm like, well, quit grow up. Quit <laughs> I got a book for you to read. <laughs> wow 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 well i know we're rounding the uh, we're rounding rounding the third base here heading home how do we land this plane i mean the things that i've been pondering and obviously that i've spoken to i'm just continuing to think about it. it's like where do i not believe in the beauty of life where do i where do i not trust myself where do i not trust other people and, and how much does that limit my ability to show up in the world in the ways that I actually want to, but I don't feel like they're possible for whatever reason. Like, why is it that I have not picked up my guitar in a week? Well, the story is I got to make money. I got to do this. I'll do that when I, but it's like, no, that's what lights me up. My job is beautiful, but it like, that's the kind of stuff that really lights me up. Why am I not doing it? Well, my summation, just I just want to reiterate the, what I started out with, too, is that um, the mother wound, the mother complex is wanting to be saved by someone, something, some process. And it's not going to happen. And if if we don't get that, and this is where I did so much damage to women prior to meeting my wife, is is I kept projecting that need on the flesh and blood women. And uh, I have a poem in my new book that just came out a couple of weeks, uh, a week ago, where I, I essentially, essentially take total responsibility for that. And and ask for forgiveness in, in the in that particular point, um, because I, I I damn sure did it. I mean, uh, and I regret it. Uh, but you know, I am trying to, in my own way, apologize and make amends. Well, what what man hasn't <clears throat> projected that onto onto women, and and how many men still surely are. Including, including myself in in my worst moments. Well, I'm I'm catching myself for the first time, really. So obviously, uh, I'll see a woman, and I'll just take that energy right back into me. You know, uh, it took to be seventy three to to do it so cleanly. I mean, I've been working at it and practicing at it. You know, I I I used to tell men. Please don't look at another woman while you're with your woman and let the energy leak out your eyes. I am more and more aware of how much time I have left to take responsibility for caring for myself. And that if I am to figure out how to love myself, that's when all of the change will occur. Um, and it's basically time. And, uh, I think constantly of how little time I have left to fulfill that. And it's a catalyst for all of us. If we look, time is always there and always encouraging. If you had have asked me at 35, I would have said, I completely pretty much got the mother complex down. <laughs> uh, the uh, let me, let, let me tell you about it. <laughs> that sounds like somebody with a mother complex. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> that was good. Oh, God. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been a, a fascinating and inspiring conversation. I'm sure if uh, if we do decide, if we do, yeah, there's so much to so much to reflect on.